mama ono, je sanjala da, da, da mi da završimo školu i da možemo da se samostalimo i da ne daj Bože da umremo tako mladi. Sama pomisla recimo da ako da mi umremo, mi smo znali recimo mama neće možda to preživi. Kako sam sjela u snijeg, tako sam nekako osvjetila da mi je fino u tom snijegu. Kao toplinu, kao da mi taj snijeg obuhvata. To se ne može zamisliti ovaj, koliko su duge zimske noći, a hladno, nismo dobro obučene, mislim, to ne može niko ni, ni da zamisli. Gladina je predstavlja problem i žeđi da nešto toplo popijemo. Ja sam rekla, drago, kažemo zadnju molitvu, jer nema više nade. Mislim, nekako ja sam razmišljala o tome da nismo, da smo tek počeli da živimo, recimo. 16 godina, to je ništa, jel? Good evening everyone, my name is Diana Jelica and I'm one of the programmers of BHFF. Uh, thank you so much for being here. Um, this block of documentary films, as you can see, was uh, focused on women um, in particular. Uh, and um, if, I, if I could note one thing that kind of ties them together, it could be women's perseverance in particular. Um, but we are very proud uh, to have two guests uh, now for the Q&A, and they're the sisters featured in the first film, first documentary film you saw. Um, I will read a little introduction about the two of them, and then I will welcome them to the stage for a conversation. Um, Shima Čuljak was born in 1967 in Bogodol, uh, near Mostar. Um, Sisters um, is a film, as you saw, about an event that took place in 1985. Um, and after that event, both of Shima's legs were amputated, um, which is also the case uh, with her sister. Uh, Shima has lived in Canada since 1990, where she currently works for a charity organization to help amputees. And Draženka Draga Čuljak was born in 1968, uh, also in Bogodol. Draga has been living in Canada since 19 1993 with her son Daniel. Currently she is working on her autobiography and she has been actively involved in para kayaking at both national and international levels and she hopes to participate in Paralympic Games in Tokyo in 2020. Please uh, join me in welcoming the sisters Juliak to the stage. Good evening and welcome to BHFF. We're incredibly proud to have you here. This is Draga and this is Shima. Thank you. So, uh, good evening. Thank you. Um, so this is not the first time you saw the film. Um, you've, we chatted a little bit in, before the screening. You said you've seen it many times. The first was at the Sarajevo Film Festival. Was yes. that the premiere of the yes. film? Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Last year, August. Last year in August. Yeah. Okay, so let's start with the inception of the film. How did it come about? Did, did, did the filmmakers, the producers contact you? Did they come to you or did you go to them? How did, how did it work, the, the starting of this project? Uh, so when our accident happened in 1985, uh, the director Zenko Juril, he was 14 or 12 years old, and, and he is from the same kind of area, like very close, living close by, and people after our accident would go to that place as a, like a shrine. Like if we have any, you know, health issues or something, they believe that God saved us there and they would just go and visit that place. So he, as a 12-year-old boy, went there with his mother and that kind of stayed with him. And when he grew up, he contacted us in, I think, first time maybe 2009 or 10 and but it was just uh, you know the us getting together and doing it them coming here or we going there so it was kind of took a while <laughs> i see was there any um hesitation on your part um in um uh, participating in a documentary about this event N no i just didn't like i didn't know that this is going to become of that the movie and uh, like we came we came uh, there like three years ago for a visit because it was our 38 years anniversary so we were there together for the first time 
and then they came and we just did like one hour interview with each one of us. So there was no like a reshooting or nothing. And like, it wasn't like, you know, did you do this well? Should you say this? It was just like one, one time shot and I think they did an amazing job. So in one sitting you told yeah. your stories. Yeah. Were you there together when you were filming this or no, you told no, your stories separately? Separately. Yeah. separately. So they, they had her first and then me second, yeah. And I would tell them, yeah, she told you already. <laughs> I see, but they wanted you to tell yes. in your own words. Yes. So then yeah, they yeah. did the mixing. Because we do notice, and I think you mentioned this at some point in the film, that you're d different in, in personality as well. Right. I think you said you were more outgoing and chatty, right? Yes. And yeah, then she more shy and... Uh, Reclusive, yeah. <laughs> so, so probably the the it, it came out in the storytelling style yes, as well, yes, right? That's true, probably. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, it did. <laughs> yeah, of course. I I noticed that as well. Yeah. But that's good. I think that I was think so. it. You know, now when I think about it, it's good. It helped us also in in surviving because we were, as because we are so different, we were never down at the same time, yes. and we were pulling each other. If we were very same, then it would be. I think it will be worse, so I think it, it was better that we are very different. <laughs> that was for me one of the, the most touching and um, um, uh, incredible aspects of your story when you noted that you were you took turns almost yes. who was down and who mm. was encouraging. Yes. Uh, and obviously that wasn't planned, but it was somehow... It, it, it just it happened like that, yeah. yeah. I think it's because we were so different, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so, so you filmed, you said, back in Bosnia, when right. you were back there you filmed, mm -hmm. and then um, the film is so striking in terms of the reenactments. So for the most part, while you are recounting the story, we don't actually see you until very late in the film, we hear your voices. W did you have any input with respect to how the reenactments were done? No, 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 we didn't. Uh, they just told us they're going to do reenactments, they're going to put lots of symbolism in a movie like our books uh, in the snow, because those books were very important to us. Actually, we told the hunters, don't forget our books when, when, they, <laughs> when they pull us out. Yeah, so like, you know, so ju they just thought there was gonna be lots of symbolism and uh, we didn't really know how they're gonna do it. And um, yeah, apparently I said, it's okay in English. So they are quoting me, I said, it's okay. <laughs> so yeah. So, so you didn't have any um, say in the final no. cut and no. how, it, how it came out, but, but I gather you, you approve. Yes, we do. Okay. <laughs> yes, we do. <laughs> uh, that's good. Uh, it's, the film is beautifully shot. The cinematography is also incredible. Um, so um, you already kind of answered one of my questions, which was this This took place in 1985. I wanted to gauge how well known this event was after the fact. Um, w were you widely known or recognized oh, yes, by we were, people? It was immediately <laughs> on the news the same evening. They, they brought us to the hospital. Uh, there were uh, yeah, the people from TV there interviewing me. Me actually and I was like oh my god you know I was so sick and could barely talk but yeah and it was in the news every day because I, I, I was clinically dead you know so so they were like are they gonna live are they gonna survive and people all over Yugoslavia former Yugoslavia you know were uh, watching and praying for us and you know actually sending us letters and encouragement and that really helped us a lot uh, in our recovery of course and I wanted to um touch more on that because that's sort of the film ends with your rescue. Yes. Um, so I want to talk more about the immediate um, aftermath. But before that, one uh, other important aspect of your survival was um, you mentioned your mother and saying that, y that this gave you strength because you knew that she would not have survived losing you. Do you want to say more about that? Well, you know, like any, my, I'm mother, you know, and I understand it even more now, but like, you know, just, uh, just the thought of losing one child, not two ch children at the same time, it's, you know, it's devastating. And we knew that, you know, like, I know our, our, our mom grew up without her mother. She was five months old when her mother passed away. She was always kind of like, she didn't know how to be a mother, but, you know, she was so loving toward us that we just knew that that will just, you know, it's, and I mean, any mother, but we, for us, it was our of course, <laughs> but it was so incredible that you found strength in thinking about someone else in this dire situation that you were. You were still more worried about someone else, yes. uh, your your own mother, and how she would uh, not be able to cope, and that gave you strength to persevere. Well, if we die, we die. But you know, it's people who is left, right? 
Yeah. They are the ones suffering, not the ones who are dead. They are dead, and of they course. don't know better. <laughs> and it doesn't mean that you know our dead or our brother wouldn't suffer, but you know we just were I don't guess closer to our mom. <laughs> yeah. So at what point? At what point did your parents realize that you were missing? Because that that wasn't clear. You told us your story because you were in the dark, sort of what was happening with them. Um, was it after your rescue? Yeah, that evening the the. Chavar, uh, Rade, uh, Drago Chavar, yeah, he went uh, with us in the ambulance, and then he went, went to police to find our mother. They found our mother, and they told her they that evening, money. yeah, that we are in a hospital. So she came immediately that evening to the hospital, yeah. And then, you know, they no, nobody still believed that, that we were there for seven days, knowing what kind of weather it was. So they cleaned the roads to get to our village get our father, ask him where we actually left, and then he confirmed our story. And then they were like, okay, this is, they are telling the truth. It was like the perfect storm, because right. both parents would have you know, thought that you were with the other one, and of right. course this was in 1985. As hard as it is for us to imagine yes. this now, there was no <laughs> cell, phones. cell phones or no <laughs> But you know, even if there was cell phones, they don't work there. I was of there course. last summer. I went all the way to Canyon, and they don't work there. <laughs> So you tested this, it would no, have yeah. still been the same. I did, actually. <laughs> That's good to know. Yeah, see, yes, there's still no there's coverage no in some areas. Yeah. No, yeah, yeah. It's very deep, you know, yeah. Do you want to talk a little bit about the immediate aftermath? Obviously, there was, as you noted, a huge media attention. But in terms of your physical recovery, you, you were going through this together. Uh, but how long did it take? What were your spirits right after, in the, in the immediate uh, weeks or months after the rescue? <laughs> well, they told our mother we're gonna die in seven days in the, in the hospital where they brought us. So some our mom went running around the city, get all the big shots in the city to get, get us to the, the hospital that knew how to deal with frostbites. So we end up in Belgrade in the military, military yeah. hospital. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, then they, they cut our legs to see how deep the frostbites were. And I was thinking, oh my God, I'm gonna have scarves on my legs, you know? <laughs> and of course, then I went into coma, and like I was dying, so they need to act immediately, and they amputated our legs. But you know, like we were very weak after our uh, surgery, but you know, like because we were kind of like, um, um, case that, you know, everybody knew about us, you know, they were like, they were really like, put a lot of attention to our recovery, you know, and, you know, we recover fast, and, and all the support that we received. Like, we received so many letters from the people from all over Yugoslavia, and as you were reading, and it's like, maybe in that moment you're not consciously really aware that those letters are helping you, but like, it's like, you know, you, these kids are writing us letters, like maybe as little as your daughter now, like, you know, like, saying, like, to be uh, courageous and fight, and, you know, and, and you kind of like, you fight now, f not just for yourself, but for everybody else who are expecting us to, to survive. And then it was just not, not possible not to be any other result. You know what I mean? Because we really had so much support. We were, in all our, whatever happened, we were so lucky to receive so much support. And that was amazing. Absolutely, and, it, and it's amazing uh, that you also understood that. And it sounds like as a as a kind of responsibility to to not let those people down that found such such. A, I don't think a, that was at that time on a conscious level. You know what I mean? Yeah. But I know now that 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 really helped us. Yes, and, and so this is what I wanted to touch upon. To now, there's been some time distance from this event and the, you've, you've worked on this film. What is the experience like of watching this film for you? Obviously, it's not like for the rest of us. This it's very happened emotional, to you. yeah. It, it, it was very emotional for all of us, especially for our mom. But yeah, uh, because we told these stories, like we are telling this story for 34 years now. And it, this, this way, like when you see it on the screen, it's more intimate way, like, you know, to relate. People can relate better to our story when they see it, actually. People told us who heard the story before, now they understand better how it was, what was going on. And, yeah. and those icicles, like I got chills every time I see them. <laughs> right. Chills. Yeah, I was wondering if there was anything re-triggering trauma as you watch, or is it a, it, was it helpful in kind of working through or gi uh, giving you closure in a way, participating in the film? 
No, we, we lived that. We, I mean, I never had trauma or, or I never had dreams. We lived that we left it there. Like, you know, I, uh, it, never, it never comes to me. And I never think about it or never dream about it. So I we, think because we talk so much about it, that it was like a therapy in a way. Yeah. Because everybody would ask and we would tell our story like, over and over, and I mean, even today, still there's talking about it. come a point it, yeah. where you get tired of talking No, about it? I mean, no, but like, I think that really was a therapy in a way that, that you know, we don't have any traumas, we don't, you know, think about it, yeah, because, because it's not like, you know, hidden deep down inside of us, we, we, we was told and told and told, and that was therapeutic, I think, as well, yeah. But it does, you know, like when I see myself cry tonight, I was like, oh. <laughs> of course. Yeah. Um, and so uh, tell us about your move to Canada. Uh, uh, it was 1990 and then yes, 1993. Yeah, I, I met my husband in 87, and he was already a Canadian citizen. So I moved. He sponsored me to come to Canada, and I moved in 1990 and uh, started living there and found work a year later at a charitable organization, the War Amputations of Canada, with help amputees all over Canada. And uh, I'm working there since like 28 years now. <laughs> Fantastic. And, and then I sponsored Raga when, after, when war started there. And, you know, she was a refugee. She, she really went through much more than I did because she went through all the bombings and everything. And then I was able to sponsor her and her son to come to Canada in 93. Mm -hmm. Tell us about, I noted that you're working on an autobiography. Tell us about that. Well, I was, like, you know, all these years, always people, they're like, oh, you should write your story, you should write your story. So finally, I think I'm mature enough that I can write, like, you know, hopefully. So, yeah, but it's a big project. And I'm still in progress, so hopefully should be done maybe in a year or so. Yeah, but you're also busy getting ready for Tokyo 2020. Yeah, I've been yeah, involved in sports, and uh, yeah, I like it, keeps me fit, and, you know, my son is now grown up. I don't have any obligations, so I turn to sports, and uh, I'm not really that young any longer, but I still hope that, I know, I try, so we'll see. <laughs> I'll be cheering for you and watching, you. Um, watching closely. Um, uh, with this, I'm going to open it up to the audience to see if there's any questions or comments. Right. And there should be mics, so please wait until a mic comes your way because we're recording this, so we want to hear you. You were clearly both very brave young women. I don't know that I can say that I would act the same way and kind of be able to stay um, still hopeful and, and you know persevere. So that's that's very incredible. Thank you. Um, so one question that I had. So one of the first things I noticed was you know. Um, Wow, does it really snow that much in Herzegovina? You know, like, I've never seen that. It was amazing. Actually, that was the worst winter they could remember in, in <laughs> '85. Yeah, I mean, in, in Mostar, in the city, you know, it was really icy. It was snow, and like you know, everybody was saying this is the worst winter. No, but like the old people couldn't remember like winter right. like that. So yeah, it was right. really bad. That's the first thing I noticed. <laughs> yes. Um, and so then uh, I know in the beginning of the movie when you're um, so the two of you start walking into the forest. You know, you kind of mention you know we've you know we walked this path before, and eventually there should be a clearing where. Um, the snow shouldn't be so bad. Um, in your kind of trail, did you ever stop and think, well, maybe this is unusual. This is more snow than, you know, we've seen before. This is, maybe we should turn back. Did you have any, you know, thoughts that maybe this is not a good idea? Um, I think we were too young and stupid, really. <laughs> so, I mean, as I said, like, I never really went that way, not the whole entire way. And she only went the year before. It was a kind of similar situation. It was lots of snow, but not as much. So it wouldn't, it, there was no snow all the way. Mm -hmm. So it would kind of snow halfway, maybe, and there would be no snow. And I didn't, you know, like, think of anything. My Shima didn't think of anything. We just kept on going, you know? Yeah. yeah, we were only 17 and 16, so yeah, we were young. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I don't know, when I, I went last summer all the way again, and I was like, oh my God. But it didn't look like that. It was dark, and it was lots of snow, and everything seems flat. Like, it didn't really seem that dangerous, like when I look at it now in the summertime, right? So we just didn't, didn't see it. I don't know. It was just our, I guess, destiny <laughs> to <laughs> to go through it. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> You're Other questions? 
Hi, thank, thank you for sharing the story. Um, I was wondering what was going on with your parents? Did they even know that you were gone yet when you had been found? Like what, what was happening at home? Well, no, because when we left uh, the village, our father knew we left, but my mother didn't know we left. So when we never arrived, she was not, you know, she was... She was thinking we didn't leave. <laughs> so there was no phone between the city and the village where my father and my mother were. So, so they the couldn't, you know, communicate. So my father thought we arrived safely, and my mother had no idea that we left. And So, so nobody was looking for us. That was the whole thing. Because nobody knew we were missing. <laughs> So that's how we knew we were going to be there till Friday because our mother would not come out, you know, but back from the city till the... Because she, there was no buses, they didn't clean the roads and there was no buses, so she had to stay. Yeah. What you would call a perfect storm, right, yeah. in English. Yeah. You know, it's, it's a kind of pun that seems um, yes. sort of fitting. <laughs> There's more hands right here in the middle. And yeah, I'm just yeah. curious about the hunters who heard you but thought that you were joking and kind of just laughed for a whole day. And then were they the same guys who later came back? Yes, they were. So th they must have felt horrible. I mean, they did save you, but later they probably felt horrible. Why didn't we act immediately? Can well, you talk a little they, bit about it? They did. Like, you know, the one guy, you know, the same guy, he came to the canyon in the morning when he heard us. But then there was no no... Foot, steps foot, in a, footprints yeah, in the footprint. snow, right? Because it was snow for two days. Uh, because he didn't believe us that we were there seven days. So he was like, what is this? Something unnatural, right? Mm. So he, they, they couldn't they see bad, you. Yeah. They just heard you yeah. and they yeah, thought they you were see us, yeah. joking or something. Yeah. So it was like there was no foot, footprints. Like, what's going on? Like, you know what I mean? Yeah. But we kept on calling and, you know. Yeah. But then there was a, the, you said the dogs were barking? Uh, yeah, we could hear yeah. them, yeah. And then the Because bird. the village wasn't that far away, and we could hear the dogs barking, barking from the village. But people, because it was so cold and lots of snow, like they would not like just walk around in a village in that of kind of weather, right? It's mostly you are outside, inside the house, beside, uh, you know, the fire. <laughs> so, yeah. Right here. You, you mentioned that at least in the movie, that there were times when you couldn't sleep at all. Uh, did that put great stress on your thinking, like a disorientation and hallucinations? Because I've been out in the woods for long periods of time and not able to sleep, and I found myself disoriented. I had hallucinations, and then when I got coherent, I realized that I had to make an effort to get out very quickly, or I. I may not have enough sense to find my way out. Did you go through that type of thing? No, we just don't remember the first night. We don't know what happened the first night. We, did we fall asleep? I guess we did because we don't remember the first night. After that, we remember everything. And the only thing we, we really had a hallucination about it was food, but like no, nothing really that was uh, in our minds, like, you know, that bad. Just the food. We wanted food. to sleep, yeah. but we could not sleep. Yes. Because we knew, uh, you know, at night there was no, nobody will, will come to save us during the night. The nights are so long, so we wanted the nights to go by faster. So we sleep and then, you know, we could. the morning comes and we wake up and we call again. But we just couldn't sleep. Like it wasn't that we did not want to sleep, we could not sleep. I think the translation was a little bit <laughs> mistranslated. And it's been some time now uh, with the prosthetics and everything. Do you feel like yourselves again? Do, do you feel whole? Or do you kind of miss some part of you that's gone? We are used to it by now, and we, I do feel whole. I don't know if I would like want to get my legs back. Like, you know, I don't know. <laughs> I now, mean, when they say, like, now they have these technologies, you know, you can, they can, like, um, get donors' legs. And I'm like, I don't know if I really want that. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, we are, we are we so are used so to our prosthetic yeah. legs that, yeah. and they are so nice, beautiful, fashionable. <laughs> 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 Good aesthetics, so nobody can even really, you know, when we walk down the street, nobody even realizes that we have prosthetics. Well, I actually, you know, I, I spoke with you a little bit as I was coming in, and I didn't know yeah. the situation, and I had absolutely no idea uh, <laughs> 
that you had gone through this and that anything unusual had happened or that you had prosthetics who just seems like Normal. everybody. Very <laughs> yes. No. And very nice. There's an, again a hand up here. Hi again. Hi again. Um, just, just kind of uh, going off of that question, um, could you talk a little bit about the recovery process and how soon afterwards did you get the prosthetic legs and how that readjustment was for you? Thanks. So because our muscles were atrophied, uh, we need to first get uh, our strength back and, and uh, learn how to walk again. It was, it was very hard. It was very hard getting used to not having legs, and we looked at each other and tried to get used to by looking at each other, not looking at ourselves, because we were not prepared psychologically for that. Like you know, I woke up from my coma, and you know, even though I was awake a few days and didn't know anything, they didn't tell me. So one day, when they finally took out all the stones out from you know tubes out of my uh, mouth and nose, and the nurse came to change the bed, I saw that I like half of me is missing. You know, like that was that was very traumatic, and uh, but yeah. The recovery was long, but, uh, you know, we got used to But again, going back, you know, like, we have so much support. Even, you know, like, when we were in hospital, we, we were in a military hospital in Belgrade. We had, uh, you know, we were in a room by ourselves. We had, like, a nurse day all the time. We, we created our own menu. Like, like, they wanted us really to recover fast. And even when we went to the rehab center where they make our prosthetic legs, we were always kind of treated special, right? So it, it was long, it was hard, but because, you know, like we really get like a special treatment and we were in a, you know, in a way celebrities uh, and we met so many people and we get so many friends and so much support. So it was, it was you know, it, it was much, it much is, easier is than, you know, like who, who there were other, other people who were even, you know, maybe in a worse shape than we were, but they never had as much support as we did. So that's one thing I think about now, like, you know, when people lose their legs or whatever, there's an accident and, and only their family comes to visit them and everybody's sad. And I, I don't know, like, you know, it's, uh, it's very hard because for us, we had all, the, all these strangers constantly coming and now visiting us and, you know, they were smiling and they were positive and, you know, so positive that really helped a lot. You were, you were really surrounded by all this support yeah. and positivity. Yes. It just goes yes. to show how important that is in, yeah. in recovery and not thinking necessarily about focusing only on what was lost right, uh, exactly. and that that will define you for the rest of your life. But yeah. in fact, you know, moving on and like surviving. Like our doctor, you know, she would tell us like, go out every day. Where did you go out? Did you go anywhere out? Go, did you go any shopping? And I'm like. In a wheelchair, while we were still in the wheelchair. Yeah. <laughs> and we would go, like, you know, we had friends and we would go out. And later on I realized she was making sure that we, we are social. So when we went back to Mostar, we were just sort of living normal. We were dancing immediately, and people were like, oh, yeah. you know, some people didn't take that well, like, you know, back home, you know, like, look at them going dancing and stuff. But you, you were not behaving as a as Yeah, a, as, as we were supposed to. Disabled persons yeah, yeah, right. should, should behave. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, they were a little bit upset, but. So you were defying all yeah. sorts of stereotypes. Mm, yes, in for the sure, yes. mm -hmm. yeah. Other questions? I actually have a question. Um, <laughs> I'd love to know, like, it's it's hard for anybody to imagine going through an experience like this. I know I have three sisters, um, and what you both have accomplished is, is really incredible. I would love to know, um, did this experience change your relationship with each other? Um, and if so, how? Well, it make us closer, you know? Like, this is something that we shared, and sure. we're always going to share, and it's like, you know, it's like... We are not twins, like there's one year apart, but it's like... You Everybody know, having, thinks we are twins. <laughs> having such a, you know, like a similar destiny and, you know, living it through. We helped each other. We helped each other to cope, you know. I think, you know, I mean, we survived because we were two of us, right? And then, you know, going through this whole process, you know, in a way maybe it's said, you know, you don't want that for your sister, right? Or she doesn't want it for me. But then, you know, it was kind of like... Helping us. Yeah, to cope. You know what I mean? Even later on, if one of us is down, another one wasn't. You know, it was always that kind of like support, right? And then, 
even when my sister went to Canada, she was, you know, she didn't leave me in Mostar. She, she sponsored me, and then we are still, you know, together, you know, living in the same country. And yeah, it's like, like we are kind of married together in a way. You know what I mean? For for the rest of the life, I, it brings you closer than, I think, any other. Like, we are much closer than with our brother, right? Canada is pretty big. Do you live in the same like city or town? We live in Toronto, yeah. Mm. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> 20 minutes away. <laughs> Thank you. And I was thinking also when you said you, you, we remember everything, even though there was a point in the film where Shima, you said, I can't remember that part, and it had to do with some with the rescue section, I think. Yes. But I think that remembering everything, if it was just one of you and, let's say, survived still somehow, it probably there would have been gaps. So you kind of threw the dialogue with yes, each exactly, other. Yeah. You helped each other remember or tell happen, the story. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, Any other questions? Final questions? Another one? Well, sure, we can. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, we can take one more. So, sorry, just one more. Um, <laughs> um, I was just thinking, so when you had the, when you fell, um, did you suffer any other injuries that you had to also that you had to recover from eventually? Or were no. you pretty much unscathed? No, no. no. I, I, just before we f fell, uh, I fell in the water. I, uh, there was ice, uh, snow covering ice, and I fell through the ice uh, up to my, my stomach. So I was, that's why Draga in the film says, uh, Shima says, uh, I'm freezing already because I was freezing. Mm -hmm. I fell in the water. <laughs> and that, that, that's the water that came down, that broke, and it made icicles, and we were able to you know, get water from those icicles. Which also was amazing. <laughs> yeah, incredible. Thank you. Uh, just one final thought before we wrap up about the film. What I think what, what the film does amazingly well too is to show the kind of the slowness of the passage of time, which you yeah. must have been experiencing, and it's just you know both intense but also excru excruciating, um, and you know the fear and you know a calm at times and alternating bet between those. Um, so I want to congratulate the filmmakers as well. But uh, like I said in the beginning, we're um, incredibly delighted that you were able to join us. Thank you so much for sharing thank your story you. and thank for you being for here. Thank you for sharing our movie. Thank you for having us. Thank you for coming. <laughs>